Howdy folks, my name is Richie, aka Bog Otter. I was fortunate enough while I was at PAX East to sit down with the folks at ArenaNet. I got to meet with Colin Johansson, John Peters, and Milad Sadat, and they went over the April feature pack, which launches today. And in it, I got to ask some questions as well as hear their insight into why they designed some of these features, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so uh, April feature pack, Tuesday. Uh, this is coming out on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to walk you through just the really high-level uh, features. We'll just dive right in. Um, John's going to start by talking to you about traits. Traits. Big changes coming to traits. Um, we've got a new trait in every single trait line, a new Grandmaster. They range from things like, you know, every time you cast a bird of foe, they, it also blinds them. Right. To, you know, turrets create bubbles around them to... Necromancers heal while they're in Death Shroud. Um, they're pretty all over the place. The one uh, general overlying thing is support. Um, we want to push support a lot in those traits just because we feel like there's a lot of good support gameplay that we that is not there yet. Right. So we're really pushing that. The fallout of that is, hey, unlocking traits would be cool. And so what we've done is, for any new characters, all the traits are now locked major traits, and you can go out in the world and play content to unlock them. You can see in this UI, if you have one that you're trying to unlock, you can actually mouse over, and it says, tells you what you need to do. So this is a defeat the boss, Terra 7 crew leader. So that, completing that event. So um, this is more of a throwback to Guild Wars 1. Skill caps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's cool. uh, one thing is reducing option shock for new players of just, I get a trait the thing, and I can actually click this, and it's like, hey... All five, six of these are locked. Let me read them all and see which one of these is interesting to me. Oh, what content do I need to do to go? It's just a much more friendly, flowing version of leveling up and learning these trait stuff. And then add to that friendliness, you know, plus one trait point every level, but that means 10 points of stats. Um, we've now broken that down to there's only 14 trait points instead of 70. You right. get one every six levels, but when you get one, you press it and you actually get a passive buff out of it. So. The, bo the points are much more meaningful. It's essentially a, a new point is equal to five old points. Are there, are there certain levels now where you don't get much for leveling up as a result of that? In the oh, let call. Yeah. Uh, yes there's, and no. There's two answers to that. Um, we've yeah. changed it so uh, traits now kick in at level 30. Uh, and we've actually rebalanced all the creatures in the game so that they stay, the balance works with traits kicking in at level 30. Okay. Um, starting at 30, you get a trait point every six levels. Uh, and at the highest levels, you, you get two trait points uh, for those levels as well. Uh, and that ties back into this. Um, we also, uh, we're, we're changing up uh, for, and this is actually, we'll be in the game in launch on China. Uh, we're adding a lot of content to leveling up in the game, um, a sense of better reward and better progression for leveling up. Um, we added a system for China launch that whenever you gain a level, it actually teaches you things about the game. Okay. Um, and so you get a little pop-up that tells you, like, there, there are waypoints in the game. This is how you use them. There is a trading post, things like that. Um, and it's predominantly stuff that we're doing to make the new player experience a lot better. Uh, at some point, we will take a chunk of that stuff uh, and look at bringing it back to the West as well. Um, in some, you know, at least the stuff that we feel like would help new players in the West. Uh, and addressing having better stuff coming from every level, more clear rewards and more sense of things unlocking for you is a big part of the things that we want to do. Okay, so this is not all... But this is phase there's, one. There's phase so this one. is phase yeah. one okay. of... Gotcha. Of, you know, making the game just feel much, much better leveling from 1 to 80. Uh, and, you know, we, we really feel like there's a lot of awesome stuff in our game, but we don't teach it very well, and so we really want to address that and make it feel like each level actually you're really getting something in return in the long run. Additionally, why well, spend points to refund traits while we're at it? Let's just get rid of that. You know, we learned our lesson in Guild Wars 1, too, so let's learn it again here that, like, people just want to respec out in the world. It's totally free. It's now plus-minus buttons. Yeah. Or, you know, refund all buttons still there, but just plus the minus of, like, hey, I clicked, you know, I clicked three by mistake, or, like, you did that, you clicked 11 times on yeah. the, uh, oh, I gotta just go <laughs> and start over again. Right. everything. <laughs> yeah, so now you just, you know, you want to go down one, just minus one, plus one, okay, there's an empty thing. Click it, shows all the stuff. You can still purchase the traits um, for trait point, for skill points and gold, um, but the primary way that people are going to be getting them is, hey, let's send people out into the world. Let's go to Harathi Hinterlands. Let's go to Mount Maelstrom. Let's go do these things and find people and join up with them, which is really what the, our Guild Wars is about. Right. right. So, so next up is the wardrobe. Step two, yeah. Um, Yay. So uh, sim <laughs> similar to the concept of trying to expand the trait system out to really give us a core system of character progression that's horizontal progression, 
Uh, we have a lot of systems in the game that are also core systems of horizontal progression, and we're modifying a lot of those to be things that are account-based. We feel like the things that your character does to progress horizontally should be based on the abilities and things that are available to them as things they can do in the world, uh, and things that should be the way your character looks, how your character uh, interacts. Those should be things that are account-bound, so you can share that between all your characters. Um, so we have created the wardrobe. Uh, and this is a place where all the skins that your character ever, uh, or any character ever gets, can become unlocked. And they live there where you can now apply them to all the characters on your account forever at that point going forward. Uh, and a big part of this will become similar to going out in the world and collecting traits, going out in the world and collecting all the skins. mini, mini skins that are out there now. Uh, and a lot of content that's in our game that people aren't aware of has skins tied to it is suddenly going to be things that people are interested in and excited about. Uh, so this is the uh, new version of the equipment panel, uh, and now the equipment panel is really focused on p items, just straight up what is an item, what is its stats. The equipment panel is really where you select the stats and the item you're going to use. Um, you go to the wardrobe, and this is where you select the look. So you can select any item, and then these are all things that John has unlocked on his account. And you can really quickly just shoot through them and see all the different skins that are available here. Um, no longer do you have to go in your inventory and select all these different items and equip them. Um, you can do this on the fly, see all the different skins, see them previewed. Uh, you don't have to use transmutation stones from your inventory anymore. Uh, you can just go up to the top right and click apply, and suddenly you're you can done. Click that. And that's it. And that's how you transmute now. Uh, and so you literally good. can just jump in here and do this over and over and over again. That, that literally, the, yeah, I can't describe how it excited I am about it as a player. Because yeah. <laughs> I actually did uh, an episode of Tyria Talk, I think, in October, where I just I discussed a, just a, a wish for this. Because I go out and I collect all the things, for you know, do all the metas for the achievements, and I feel like I... I don't really want to put them because I don't want to lose this and so but this is just this makes the it incentivizes everything really yeah, yeah I mean so. it really you know there's so many things that we do for rewards in our game that once you had a couple skins that you really liked it's like do I really want right. to lose this one I don't know and it makes you not want to go do any of that stuff yeah. so as an extra bonus you can now go to the bank and the bank has a third tab on it that happens to look like a wardrobe uh, that literally shows you every single skin in the game that you can collect and whether you've got it unlocked or not awesome so. Bang, let me so, get light armor. So we can get lost in here. Oh, yeah. Light <laughs> leggings. Well, there's only 57 light leggings. That's it. As it turns out, you know, only, what, 92 short bow skins in the game? <laughs> <laughs> so. Now, some of, the, some of the town clothes are becoming single use, like, or single outfits, and then some of them are going to become, like, tonics. So yeah. they're getting converted into three different things. Um, okay. Some town clothes will become outfits, like what John's got here. An outfit basically is straight up a skin that overrides your entire armor set. Yeah, you so can wear you it in combat. you click on the wardrobe, you actually hear you can drag an outfit there okay. and put it there, and then it will override, override. your set. But you can fight with it. So that's the first type. A lot of the town clothes are being converted into armor skins. Um, so like all the, almost all the hats are just helms now, and you can wear them in combat, awesome. wear them with whatever outfit you want. There's like festive Santa hats in there, and the fuzzy Santa bear hat. Yeah, all, <laughs> that's a heavy, of, heavy armor. Obviously. Nice. All of those are just straight up going into armor skins. Uh, and then there's a small subset that we feel like are just a little too weird or don't make sense to be armor skins. Uh, those will become tonics that you can double click. You're wearing the thing. If you get hit in combat, it takes it back off again. Okay. Um, so those are the, the three different fates of town clothes. Uh, one of the greatest things about this is we feel like because we're getting those to be things that you can now wear in combat, um, we can make a lot more of them and they become a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Yeah. Uh, we're really at a point where it's like, you know, town clothes were being used so sparingly. wasn't really worth our time to keep making them. Right. Uh, and so we felt like this is, you know, a really good change for us to make those worthwhile things for us to continue to keep making and adding to the game. Absolutely. But what are the different ways you can get the, uh, the transmutation crystals after the conversion when the patch goes live? So all the places that you can get them now, you can still get them uh, after the patch. They just, instead of giving you transmutation stone items, it just gives you a charge. Um, so things like map complete, dailies and monthlies have a chance to give them to you. Um, all of that content all has been swapped over and just has those on the, the reward tables now instead. Okay. Um, you can also earn gold and go buy gems off the store and buy more charges, or you can just straight up buy gems for cash if you want. Uh, and then buy the charges. Sure. Um, we are lowering the price down. So the level 80 uh, transmutation stones before um, charges are actually slightly cheaper than that. Okay. Uh, because we figure people are going to want to use this more, so we want to make it a little bit more accessible as well. Awesome. I was asked on Twitter before I came, are the fused gauntlets going to be available for light, medium, and heavy? I believe so, yeah. 
should be on. I, and I think if you have I any, pretty sure if you have any one of them, you get all three. All Generally, three? Okay. any of the Living World stuff that we had, mm -hmm. three different copies of it. We're trying to make it so you just get all of them if you have any of them. Awesome. Like, some oh, there it is. Very, like, yeah, you all yep. Bam, there they are. Preview. So if, I have, the head, so if I have the heavy, you, you should, should unlock on the other two. You should get the light and medium automatically. Yeah. Awesome. Here, search. The fuse. Heavy gloves, heavy fuse gauntlets. There's a search feature. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm like mousing over one by one with my green tool tips. Yeah. We practiced that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait for that. That's, that's, that's the best feature. So, yeah. So, big changes for PvP. Overall, just integration. Earning gold, you know, earning items, actually being part of the game. Yeah. Sort of the whole idea that we wanted it so that you didn't have to play, you didn't have to play PvE to play PvP. And so we actually made it so that you didn't want to play PvE to PvP and vice versa. And what we actually really wanted is that you didn't have to, not that you didn't want to. Right. And um, we kind of figured that out now, I think, um, in that... You know, these all give rewards now, and there's cross rewards, but PvP, you can still load in and just be level 80, make builds, go play, but it's not. But it doesn't make you want to feel like I'm not earning anything for my PvE right now. So all that that has kind of gone away, which I think is going to be really, really nice. And uh, part of that is this great new PvP build maker, and so that, you know, when you go to play PvP, you used to have to do so much to switch your build. And yeah. Just wasn't worth it sometimes, and so now you have my PvP build. Let me pick what uh, runes I want, and here's the list of runes, and I can just drag it on, and that's what I've got. Um, sort by category. I'm running condition damage, so I'm gonna get these runes with a crate, which have a really cool new six point bonus instead of just plus damage versus underwater. They actually do a cool thing with your elite skill, which is like. When you use an elite, you inflict bleeding, torment, and poison for eight seconds to nearby foes. Nice. I've actually been running these on an L, on a Condi Ellie. But you know, you can just switch stuff super fast. It's really great. Um, Two-handed weapons now have two sigils, but you can. Right. And for PvP, getting in here, you pick your two-handed weapon, you grab sigils. Got it. Like you're done. Like you don't have to do all that extra work. All your trade is on this. Your trade stuff is on this panel too. So saving uh, PvP templates. <laughs> This is an awesome feature in Guild Wars 1, uh, yeah. and something that we are aware of an interest yes. in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and this, fundamentally, this whole, like, locking down how we want the traits to work, locking down these PvP builds, like, I mean, we, it's definitely step one. Yeah. Um, and it opens up a lot of possibilities for yeah. us, for sure. The second PvP thing is Roar Tracks. You know, you move along, you activate a track. When you play games, the track increases. I've actually gone up, like... 11% today just doing demos, so <laughs> go reward tracks. Um, uh, you know, here's this reward track. At, it's a PvP one that's like the Balthazar reward track. You get champion bags, dragonite ore, imperial fragments. Actually, at the end of this, there's like a Balthazar backpack that's unique to PvP. It's really awesome. Yeah. Um, there's ones that give you the dungeon stuff, and those kind of rotate in if you haven't, or they're unlocked if you've played the dungeon. There's Crichton region track so there's like hey this has regional unique skins for this area so like basically a way to like you know in pve you select like i'm gonna go play this kind of content and that kind of sets your rewards for you sure. this is sort of the way to do that without saying this is the content i'm playing this is the track that i'm on because that's the rewards i'm gaining when i'm playing because pvp the content is killing the other people right right yeah i like i like how there's a lot of crossover there like you have to you have to do the story mode of the dungeon on the PvE side to unlock one of the dungeon tracks, right? Yeah. But then you can do PvP to get the rewards, and PvE players might say, hey, you know what, I have i can't do a dungeon group right now, but maybe I can start working on that set by doing PvP. So yeah. it gets players to mix it up. And the wardrobe crossover, too. You know, the old PvP system was actually one of the few places where we exposed how many skins there were in the game. Sure. And how just big that list was, and... All that stuff that you've unlocked there that was in your PvP locker is already unlocked for you in your wardrobe, which is pretty huge. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot. There's going to be a lot of great crossover here. Um, and like the last thing, just as a bonus, is there's a new PvP map. Um, we've seen a lot. You know, we know about our custom arenas, yep. and we've seen a lot of people just being really excited about. Just, hey, we just want to, like, play deathmatch in our arena. We just want to, like, kill each other. We, we ran a 2v2 deathmatch tournament, and they're, like, trying to do it on, like, Legacy of the Faux Fire. And it's just like, don't bother. We're going to make you a map. So <laughs> what we did is we made this 
this uh, deathmatch map. It's called Courtyard. It's got tons of great, like, really good tactical fighting stuff, line of sight, getting up on top of things. You guys had me on the, uh, the ready up. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a PvE guy. Nice. Yeah, was, so I have a. That was actually really awesome to see, like, how, how well everybody did. You know, everybody was making fun of, you know, it's like, oh, there's no way these PvE guys are going to come in. Everybody did really and, well. Yeah, Jumbro was, was telling me about it. He's like, where'd you get that banner warrior spec? Nobody could kill you. I was like, <laughs> Like, somebody helped me. <laughs> Sometimes those guys are so focused on, like, if you're the only way you can do it is That's if you're right. a PvP guy. And I was like, yeah, yeah. these guys, they they can really play this game. Yeah, it was, that was fun. It was definitely fun. It's a cool map. Yeah, so it's really great. You have, like, a lot of good landmarks of, like, that's the blue side. Here's the red, red flags, red flowers. So how, how does it work? In, so it's, it's a score-based deathmatch? Yeah, so just... Kills equals 25 points, you're going to 500. But, of course, it's custom arena, so you can actually set the scoring. Okay. Want. Yeah, you know, one, one of the things that, that has been really exciting for us is we, uh, after announcing that this stuff was coming for PvP, um, about a week later we announced the Tournament of Legends. Um, yeah. So you can win, actually win a Legendary in PvP. Uh, yeah. And I think the most number of teams we've ever seen sign up for one of our events in the region is maybe around 30. Like, I think we had that for our, our championship last August. Okay. In less than a week, we've had over 200 teams sign up for the Tournament of Legends. And wow. it's like, that that just speaks volumes for how much people were looking for changes like this to, yeah. to really integrate PvP into the rest of the game. It's awesome. I mean, it's that's more than we ever saw for any event ever in the history of Guild Wars. Guild Wars 1 never came close to 200 people signing up for, uh, or 200 no, teams, teams yeah. signing up for an event. Um, so that's that's been really exciting for us. Our PvP team is just through the roof about where, where stuff's at with that. That's cool. We have one last really big thing that's coming with the feature pack, uh, and it's really not a feature. It's a fundamental change to the way that our game is structured and the architecture behind it, which is going from the world server model in PvE right. um, to the mega server model. Okay. Uh, and, you know, really the, the interesting thing behind this is when we chose to have worlds for servers, the reason we made that choice is we wanted to increase the odds you would run into the same people all the time. Um, I think that is the greatest strength of the world system is you're on a world, you get to know the people who live there, sure. that's the community you play with. Um, the downside of that, obviously, is over time it gets harder and harder to find people to play with as people are on different worlds. Um, or if it's late at night and there's not a lot of people to play on your world and then we're at off hour, there's nobody to play with. Um, right. And so we asked the question, can we develop something that solves both of those problems? Uh, and what we ended up coming up with is Mega Server basically allows us to more frequently increase the odds that you run into the same people because we run algorithms to basically always make sure that you run into people from your party, from your guild, from your world, and similar social interests as well. Um, and the capacity for this is pretty limitless in the, the grouping that we can do. Uh, but it's actually more likely with the mega server model that you will see the same player uh, regularly than it is with the world model. Okay. On top of that, we're taking all of the maps that have a few people in them, or, you know, there are certain maps like Harathi Hinterlands that just never have more than five or ten people in it on any, even on our packed world. Okay. And we're combining them all together, and so there are no more overflows anymore, there are no more worlds in PvE, they're just maps. And whenever a map fills up with people, another map is created. Uh, there's, we leave a lot of room in it for sorting and adding people who have similar shared interests. Uh, and it means wherever you're playing in the world, you're going to run into a lot more people, and you're going to run into a lot more people that you have shared interests with. Uh, which is just awesome for us across the board. It takes everything that we've talked about so far, the idea of going out in the world and collecting traits, um, the idea of going out in the world and getting all these skins. The perfect complement to that would be if you had a whole bunch of people to play with all the time. And the mega server system really allows for all of that to work. It means right. that the greatest thing about Guild Wars 2 is other people don't ruin your experience. They don't they don't steal your kills. They don't ruin your ore nodes. They don't, <laughs> they don't destroy your quests because we have events that scale. Uh, and we can embrace all of that and say, go out in the world and play with a bunch of people. And it hopefully, you know, from the testing we've done where we've actually turned it on and people don't even notice, all they do is there's just more people around them. Um, it should feel that seamless, right? It really, like, we don't want it to be a jarring thing. It should just feel like, wow, this game has a lot of people all the time. That's really the feeling that it's going to give. Uh, and it's going to take you back to kind of that launch feeling of there's people running everywhere wherever you go. And it's going to feel that way every day, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and we're, we're really excited about what that's going to mean for the game going forward. Yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be really good to see those underpopulated places suddenly have players in it, those events that you can't do by yourself and stuff yeah. like that. It seems like there are some, like, some technical hiccups that you guys have to kind of make some tough decisions on with regards to that, like contested waypoints. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the way it's going to work is any waypoint that could be potentially be contested cannot be 
gone to directly anymore. Correct. Yeah, because we have no idea. I mean, there might be 20 copies of that map up, and in seven of them it's contested, and 13 it's not. And we just don't know. We don't know exactly where you're going to drop into the second you click the button, um, literally until you click it. And so right. I think the feeling was the only real clear option we had was contest them all, uh, get into the map, and then if you see stuff that's available, you can jump over and do it. Are there some solutions that you guys maybe thought of that might might take a lot more work down the road to implement, or do you think this is just how it's going to stay? Uh, I think this is probably how it's going to stay. Um, I think the content that's tied to contested waypoints would be the thing that we would, we're would going to monitor, see what the feedback's like. I mean, this is true of everything with mega servers, is we're keeping the team that built the mega server structure in place, okay. even after they ship, so that we can respond to feedback, see how it's working, react to what players are seeing, and, and make changes if we need to. Um, you know, I think to completely re-architect the way that your server structure works and just say good enough, sorry, uh, is, is a really dangerous thing. So yeah. we, we want to have the capacity to come back and make adjustments. Uh, and I can certainly see where there is certain content that's gated um, by contested waypoints. that sure. It may not be the best thing. We just don't know yet how that's going to play out. Um, but, yeah, I, I think... Any of the solutions that we talked about so far, and you know, this is a great thing for our players to brainstorm too, is what other solutions they can come up with. The, the solutions we came up with, we don't, we don't think any of them are the right thing for the game. We felt like having those contested is better overall, um, and then you can get in there and you want to unlock them within the map that you're in. It feels like that's a victory for you. Um, right. I guess the other option you could do is just allow people to go right into them, but then they could just die right away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and sometimes we don't want them to like it's behind a gate that hasn't opened. That's right. right. Or and anything like stuck. that. Yeah. Uh, so it's. it's it's a tough balance. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we can make it click, and then you never know what's going to happen in whichever map you're going to end up in. Maybe it was contested, and you get spit back to another place. We felt like that's just jarring and weird. Like, yeah. if you press the waypoint, you should know what's going to happen and end up there or not end up there. That makes sense. Um, especially for newer players, it'd be really weird to click on it and suddenly yeah. not end up there. I wouldn't understand, like, what's going on with that. Yeah, I could see that. In regards to mega servers with uh, and the world boss schedule, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of feedback about um, guilds that are based around killing the tough world bosses, and they're concerned that uh, they might not be able to get their large group into the single map because right. right now they go to a low population server, they kind of take over a map, and then they kill it. Do you think that people need to kind of jump in and play it for themselves, or how do you kind of respond to that? Yeah, I think I think they need to play it, and they'll see that that's not really that big of a concern. Literally, they can do exactly what they did before. They can get people in a one of the maps that doesn't have as many people in it, and be, and actually it's easier to get them all over there now because in the sorting algorithms that we use, everybody goes to that map. They're all going to end up getting funneled into the same map together because they're in the same party and the same guild, and so they're they're going to be preferred to drop in together. Um, or a small group of them get in there, they get on one that doesn't have a lot of people, and then everybody channels over into that one. You can still right-click and join people who are in your party to go wherever they are if you're in the same copy of the map. Um, so I think it doesn't make that any harder. Uh, I think the upside to it is we added the ability for the guilds to kick off those events whenever they want. Yeah. And so in a lot of ways, it's going to make it easier um, because people know now when the windows are that those events are going to happen. They're like, oh, two hours from now, it's a qual is going to happen. I'm going to camp in the map for two hours until it starts. And if the guild doesn't get there early enough to do that, or they don't get their own copy copied off to get everyone in there, they just can't do it. Uh, and I think that's way worse than being able to, at any odd hour, you and your guild can go there. There might be five or ten or twenty other people in the map, and we think that's okay. It's like those people, those might be, those five might join your guild because you did this, and they they get to see it going on. Uh, but you have the capacity to go down there, get your guild together, play the content, and fire it off on your own, and you don't have to contend with. 10,000 other people who are all trying to get there at the exact same time and do it, yeah. except during those three windows that it fires on our timers every day. Um, and that's during prime time once in North America, prime time once in Europe, and prime time once in China. Uh, and you can also show up for the non-prime time one for your region if you want to. Right. Um, but your guild can just go trigger it, too. Some of those guilds are... Um, they span multiple servers, mm -hmm. though, so they might have a harder time unlocking some of those features until the whole guild... Yeah, that is, thing. that is an unfortunate challenge. We really wanted to fix guild merging for this release, and it's just way too complicated for us to get it in in time. Um, yeah. and so that's something we are going to do. Obviously, we announced it's coming. Uh, and yeah. so, you know what? It's it's one of the tough spots that comes with this, is in the grand scheme of things, this thing is way better for the game, and we'd rather just do it now. Sure. Uh, and they will catch up. You know, they'll... They'll they'll power their guilds through if they have to to, to keep that content going. But yeah, I, I, it's one of the it's one of the few parts that definitely is not ideal, but it's the best solution that we've got right now. Yeah. There's no plans at this point to to eventually do away with worlds. Uh, not 
not for world versus world. Uh, in PvE, really, they won't exist anymore. You'll never see what world. You're just in a map. It'll look exactly like this. Um, but behind the scenes, it's a sorting thing that we use to help sort you with players of the same world. So it's more likely you'll see those players. Yeah. Uh, and world selection does completely matter for world versus world. We will never do away with that. Um, we think that's extremely important to us as people have really in world versus world. They built that bond. They built that sense of I fight for this world and I care about them and I hate that world. Uh, and we <laughs> don't want to take that away at all. Uh, and it, and it's it's still an important community because it's part of who you get sorted with in the PvE mega server too. Uh, if anything, now because of that, we can actually maybe take that even further uh, in world versus world. We can embrace that even more. Is that real strong sense of world and pride? It, it becomes an alliance that you belong to in a sense um, and that you fight for in, in world versus world. So that's that's a pretty cool. The, the things we can do with it open up, I think, even more. Now, do you do you foresee um, feature packs being something that you continue to do, um, or do you think they're going to be sprinkled back into the content patches like they used to be? I, I think this has been extremely successful for us. We really like the separation that we're getting between the living world and content and the very directed message that we get when we do living world releases and the directed message we get when we get a feature pack. Um, we've seen both in communicating with the players. It's made our job much easier. And them understanding what we're doing, they it's made it much easier for them to comprehend the stuff that's coming in builds and what the More builds cohesive, are. Yeah. yeah, and you and you get these ties, right? You know, this this pack, everything kind of ties to one broader theme. And we may not always do that, but it makes it we can really pick a goal and say this is a big part of the game we want to address. Let's do that. And Living World is we want to take the story of the game and continue it. Let's do that. Yeah. Uh, and I think looking back on releases that we combine the two together. Inevitably, one of the two always overshadowed the other one. You know, yeah. when we did Tequadle, everybody talked about Tequadle and looking for group was with that, and that was huge. We spent I don't know half a year building that system, and it was like, oh, cool, LFG, and then right, and everybody was focused on, can we beat Tequadle? Can we do it? <laughs> uh, and and that's that's not ideal for us. We really want to be able to get out there and say this is the big stuff that we're getting right now. Um, certainly makes uh, I think your guys' lives a little bit easier on, on the press side, as you can really focus in on one yeah. one cohesive message too. Uh, so yeah, we, we absolutely will continue to do feature packs. Um, we're still we don't really have a cadence yet of exactly how the rotation between living world seasons and feature packs will go in the future. Uh, okay. That's something we'll come back and talk about more down the road. But uh, yeah, ab- absolutely, it's something we will continue to do. We're really happy with how this is going. When season two of the living world launches, mm-hmm. do you anticipate it going back to a two week cadence at that point, or we don't know? Everything for season two, there's definitely going to be some changes to the structure of, of living world and, and things that we want to do. We've seen a ton of player feedback. We did a, a collaborative development discussion on our forums with our players about it. Uh, we've seen a ton of feedback from folks in the media talking about cool things and ideas and suggestions. And we've really listened to all of that. Uh, and so we're going to apply those lessons to, to season two. Um, but the timing, the cadence, and the structure of season two, something that we're not going to talk about today. Uh, yeah. We'd actually love to come back and talk to you about that in a little bit down the road when we get a little closer to, to season two. Regards to communications across multiple guilds, are custom chat channels something that will ever be considered? I, you know, I think it's something that we hear guilds asking for, in particular really large guilds that have a bunch of different chapters. And, and we're certainly aware it would, it would help with communication, and it's something that you know we know people are asking for. Okay. Yeah, we we can't really talk about anything in, in development or not in development at this point. We'll just yeah. say that we're yeah. we're well aware people are looking for that. Yeah. I appreciate you guys taking the time to show me this awesome stuff. I can't wait till Tuesday. Yeah, thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming to check it out. Well, that's gonna wrap things up. I want to thank Mila Sadat, Colin Johansson, and John Peters for taking the time to uh, explain these features to me and answer my questions. And if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate you giving it a like and a favorite and subscribe to the channel so you can be notified when future videos are released. I hope everybody has a fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Take care.